This is March, and March equals madness. And today, we're talking brackets. Yes, March 2nd, we're talking brackets. Good morning, and thank you for enjoying it with a six-pack. This is Six Pack, the only podcast that's talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbrus. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. Today, we have an awesome interview with my favorite bracketologist on the internet, T3 Bracketology. We're going to be breaking down what's the deal with this Wisconsin basketball team right now. What about this free fall is going to affect Wisconsin's seeding in March Madness in the NCAA tournament, because I do firmly believe Wisconsin is still a lock. We're going to be talking all about that, what teams Wisconsin might be facing in the bracket, and talking a little bit about, you know, what is bracketology? What is going to go into deciding where Wisconsin falls in the bracket, where every team falls in the bracket, and a lot, lot more. Uh, So thank you for listening, and up next, we bring in T3 Bracketology. And now we welcome to the pod for the very first time, T3 Bracketology. Thank you for joining us on the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. It's It's uh, been a, a fun season of Bracketology so far. I'm looking forward to the, the stretch run here to close out the season. Yeah, I, I think I, I want to mention this. One of the, my favorite things about you that I've found just through the internet on Twitter is your willingness to engage with fans, answer questions about the Bracketology process overall and that's kind of where i want to start because i think you as well as anybody knows there's a lot of folks that get you know some stuff wrong and just a general baseline of you know what goes into making the bracket what what does and does not uh get considered by the committee overall when creating this bracket when deciding where teams are going to end up being seated yeah so i'll start with the part that is kind of the the most misconceptions if you will of things that are really have Either it's very limited amounts of impact in the seed lists, seeding both and selection, or have zero impact. There's a couple of things that come to mind. One, very obvious, I say it all the time on Twitter, the AP poll has nothing to do whatsoever. I, I think one that's a really big, if you're watching this today, is University of South Florida. It's super cool that mm. they got ranked 25th overall in the AP poll. And I would not say that their at-large chance is zero but it's still way into the single digits that they're going to get a bid into the tournament without winning the American, but they're ranked 25th, which if you think about a seed list, that's a seven seed. I have them as a 12 because they're in first in the American. They'd get a bid if they won the American conference, but their odds are still like 4%, if you will, to get an at large, but they're 25th. Gonzaga before last night when they beat San Francisco on the road, their odds were not great. They've been ranked for weeks. So that's one of those things that I think for sure is a big one. And then another one, especially now that we're, I mean, today's March 1st, so conference season's almost over. For some, it ends this weekend. For a lot of the bigger conferences, we have one more week. Mm -hmm. Conference standings is something that comes up a lot of, hey, my team is third in the conference, and this other team is fifth or sixth. Why are they seated two or three spots above? One of the most common questions, I think I get multiple of those about different teams every single day. And I think there's really two reasons for that. One, the season started before January. November and December does matter. I know some people like that a lot. Some people don't like that as much. It it really varies there depending on who you ask, but the season did start before January. And then two, in most of these conferences, there's not a true round robin anymore. That's that's definitely Mm -hmm. the case with the Big Ten. You're not playing every single team home and away anymore. There's even some conferences, it's really weird. I know it's one, today's the last day of the Sun Belt and there's this battle for the the two seed versus the three seed and it's between Mm -hmm. James Madison and Troy and they don't play all season in their conference which is just wild. Some of those teams have played each other twice, but they don't even, James Madison and Troy don't play at all. So if you think about that, the the schedules within each conference aren't even equal, let alone at a conference like the schedule, things like that. So it's it's something that definitely the committee are human beings. I'm a human being. It's in the back of their mind, but for the most part, conference standings really don't matter. And then the last one in terms of, I mean, there's plenty of things I could share, but the last one that's really big is, is with the net where some people get really focused on the actual net ranking of a team. Mm-hmm. And I'll touch on with the things that are the most important of actual numbers to focus on, but an individual team's actual net ranking really doesn't have any role in terms of seeding or selection. It seems like every year there's new bar- parameters set of, hey, this team that's in the 70s got an at-large bid, this team in the 40s didn't. Well, that's a 30-spot difference, so obviously it's not really playing a huge role for them. What's most important with the net is your opponent's net 
like as an example with Wisconsin, Minnesota losing their last game. They, they dropped to 76 in the net. That road game's now Q2. You'd love to have another quad one road win. I don't know how much at this point in the season now that's going to impact Wisconsin seed, but for yeah. some other teams, maybe more on the bubble, that kind of thing's super important. Those teams right on the fringes of being quad one versus quad two, depending on where you played them. So that's a lot more important than your own net. But in terms of what's actually the most important, it's really what we would call just everything that's on the team sheet. And it's going to vary depending on different groups, the teams that the committee is talking about at that point in time, what's going to be most emphasized just based on who those teams are. So it's four main metrics. There's two that are resume based, based on who you beat, where the strength of the resume, et cetera. And that strength of record or SOR, and then KPI, which is the other one. Most of the time, they're pretty close to each other, but there are some differences depending on some conferences, some teams, you'll see a little bit of a gap. And then there's two predictive metrics that operate much closer to the net wood. For most teams, they're a lot closer to like the net ranking. It really looks into the efficiencies of the teams, offense, defense, pace, who you played, et cetera, and then mm -hmm. ranks teams based on that. The one that most people are aware of is Kempom. It's the one that gets talked about a lot. And then BPI, that's on ESPN's website as well, is the other one. So those are a little bit more important for seeding. Resume is kind of holistically important for everything, but especially if you're thinking about like last four in versus first four out, those resume metrics are more important. And then the last thing that gets talked about the most often are just the quad records. So based on where your opponent's net falls, quad one, quad two, losses in quad three versus quad four, those are the areas that are going to be the most important for the, the selection committee. Yeah. And, and let's talk about, you know, those, those quad records, that res resume as a whole, when you're looking at Wisconsin right now, what do you see as the strongest points and, and the weakest points on the Badgers resume uh, heading into heading into March? The strongest points are there's, there's plenty. I mean, there are, there are five seed today for me. Some people would have them as low as a six. I think any lower than like a high six feels off, but you're going to see really anywhere today from a five or a six. And it's the sheer quantity of quality wins between Q1 and Q2. It kind of fluctuates. It's really been mostly at 12 total. But like I said, with the Minnesota game, it shifted back to Q2. So today it's six in Q1, six in Q2. And the fact that when you add those two together, even with Wisconsin struggles of late, it's been a little more up and down. It's still, I believe, 12 and 10, 12 and 11, 12 and 9, depending on the day. It's over 500, which is another important factor. It's not just the fact that, hey, we have 12 of them which is still much higher than a lot of teams that are in the hunt on that seven line, trying to get to a six on the six line, trying to get to a five, but Wisconsin's still over 500 on that area. And then there's no, like, there are some losses that are tough for sure. And we'll get into that on the, the part that's more of a weakness, but there isn't anything that's like a true bad loss in terms of quad three or quad four. And mostly in the big 10, because even Michigan is still a quad two loss on the road. They're really, it's really losing home games. Mm -hmm. against bad opponents you can lose home games to some of the good ones but and wisconsin just hasn't done that so that's kept them up really well and then i've been a very hot topic this year and, and most years is non-conference strength of schedule for wisconsin that's been pretty consistently top 30 it might even be top 20 as of today overall strength of schedule is definitely important but it's something that if anybody was watching the top 16 reveal about a month ago two or three weeks ago or so iowa state had a fantastic resume looked like they could almost be to a two seed but their non-conference strength of schedule, depending on the day, depending on those teams, is in the mid-300s. And they got penalized yeah. for that. They were not only not a two, they were almost a four. That's not an issue for Wisconsin. That's not going to be something that's going to penalize them. It's going to be used as a strength. And they actually got wins in the non-conference as well. It's not like they just played a super strong non-conference, say maybe like Michigan State, and all Michigan State did was beat Baylor. Wisconsin's got a few good wins in the non-conference that helps. The main areas that struggle for Wisconsin's resume are primarily just road games in general. It's not a great road record, especially when you look at quad two. There's just one quad two road win, and it's Minnesota, the one that flipped. And then mm -hmm. there's, I think it's four losses that are in quad two on the road. That's like the majority of the losses that Wisconsin has in quad two. That's been a big issue. There obviously are some nice road wins that fall into quad one but just the sheer number of opportunities they've had in those top two quadrants that some smaller schools don't get. And Wisconsin, I think is like maybe three and eight on total on the road, maybe three and nine, three and eight. Mm -hmm. That's one of the weaker areas where some of those other teams, like say a Clemson, that's kind of in that area. If Clemson gets a couple more quad one wins, it's going to be hard for Wisconsin to justify having a better resume there to that team. 
Some others as well in that area is like a Kentucky jumped up to a four seed. They have a lot more road wins. That's the biggest weakness along with just the number of losses is getting a little bit higher, but still it's eight games over 500. I'm not seeing that as a big issue right now, unless it gets a little bit worse. Yeah, I, I think one of the things Badger fans are concerned about is just the volume of losses at this point, losing six of the last eight. And if Wisconsin were to lose out at this point, one, that would give them their first loss outside of quad one and quad two, most likely with the loss to Rutgers at home. Yep. Plus, Wisconsin would finish with 13 losses on the season, which was the number of losses that Wisconsin finished the regular season last year with, uh, which that team, of course, did not make the NCAA tournament. Um, how are you looking at the team with its kind of floor there? If it were to lose out, potentially uh, it's a still look like an NCAA tournament team to you just because of, you know, you said earlier on in the show, some people like to pretend uh, January and December don't exist. Look, I, I think January, December, and November should be the only thing that exists. Um, <laughs> yeah. That would be great um, for Wisconsin. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but what do you think about the, the potential floor for Wisconsin <laughs> if, you know, really everything kind of goes goes to crap here? Yeah, I, I can I can 100% guarantee that the floor is still in the tournament. There is no floor that exists. I've, I locked Wisconsin a while ago, and I, mm -hmm. I can understand some fans' frustrations that are not Wisconsin fans or even Wisconsin fans that are like, this has been – tougher to watch of like, how is this team still a lock? The definition of a lock, you can't unlock it. Once they're locked in, I've made that assumption where if they can lose out from that point, based on what the resume is today and the losses that could come, they're in the field. So the floor is definitely lower than that. My gut says the worst case scenario, 18 and 14, I think is the finish, losing the next three, first game of the Big Ten tournament, 18 and 14. I would say it still feels like the 8-9 game to me mm -hmm. because you're, you're most likely, it's obviously hard to predict who that Big Ten game is, and there's just a couple of teams where on a nude for floor, it's Q3. But if we assume it's not Michigan, most of the others stay above 100. I think Indiana's kind of close. So if it was Indiana, that's Q3. But if we just assume it's a Q2 neutral loss, and then you have the Q3 a loss, like you said, that you add to Rutgers, if that stays there, I would say it's it's maybe looking like an 8-9 game in that particular situation, but there's still so much to like about Wisconsin's resume. There's a lot of teams in that range in the 8-9s right now. A lot of them are from the Big 12 that had horrible okay. non-conferences, no good non-conference wins, and they have a very tough schedule to finish too. So if they only get like one more good win and Wisconsin loses out, their resume is probably still better. So I'd still say that you could you could argue, I think some people would say a floor is a 10, but I really think the floor is an eight or nine for myself, and I'd probably still even lean an eight just because even with the skid, Wisconsin is top 23 in every metric. And this is a like – they can't really be playing much worse and they're still top 23. So there's obviously still a lot to like. Yeah. They built a fantastic base at the beginning of the season. Hopefully they can get back to that just in time for the, the tournament. But I think because they built that up and the metrics are not plummeting into the thirties and forties, it's hard to even imagine worse than an eight, to be honest. Yeah. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And over, overall, you know, what does, the skid bring into this the seeding process this this late in the game there's a team that looks so much different now from what it did at the beginning of the season affect how it might look you know i know there's a lot of talk about comparing blind resumes but at the end of the day there's going to be some recency bias involved i'm sure um how do you think wisconsin might might fare in in that room when its name gets brought up with the struggles it's had as of late will that come into play significantly or not it's not something that's going to come into play significantly i know there's been talks in the past of the committee about like last 10 games things like that that's not something that they use it's not a metric that's on the team sheet it's not something that's supposed to be discussed but they are still human beings like you said so it's not like they just plug the numbers into a computer spit it out hey they struggle at the end we're going to give that more weight or whatever in some formula like that's just not how it works they all are, have access to the team sheet, the same data. And then there's different representatives that have been kind of point people for certain conferences all season. And so whoever that big 10 point is, will probably be the most spokesperson for a team like Wisconsin and might talk about that, but it really comes into play more often with like significant injuries. And that's where you see a seed penalty for later in the year, especially if they don't have a ton of data. Like mm -hmm. if you think about like a Providence, as an example, they had an injury to one of their best players. Yeah. But now they have a lot of data afterwards where they've shown they picked up a couple quad one wins. They've struggled, but they've kind of shown they deserve to still be in the mix. And so it's not going to be as big of a deal. Where on the flip side, you see something like a 
Mississippi State, their best player was out all non-conference. That's their two worst losses. Since then, they've been an above 500 team in the SEC, a top three league probably this season. That's going to be a, a plus for them in that case, where they've been playing strong down the stretch, and it's a positive, but it's mostly from an injury perspective, where one or two injuries here and there doesn't really play a role, and same with like this skid for Wisconsin. It's They're truly going to be looking at it from a full season resume standpoint. It might be something that comes up because they're human beings, but it's not really going to be an issue that impacts the seed, and that's why – Again, I think some fans that maybe are not fans of Wisconsin might be more frustrated with the seed still being at a five for some people or a high six because, I mean, I think everyone would agree they don't really look like a top 20 team today, but they were playing like a top 10 team before. So if you think about the mm -hmm. average of those two things, it still kind of falls into like 19 to 24 ish, which is that five to six seed range. And that's, that's really the best way to try and look at it. I know it's hard because we're all humans. The recency bias is like, this team doesn't look like a Sweet 16 Elite Eight team like it did in December and January where the offense was clicking. This was like one of the better Wisconsin teams in the last three or four years. It struggled a little bit more, but that's why we play a full season of 30-plus games so they all get that, that same credit. Yeah, unfortunately for college football fans, uh, all the games actually count and matter. Um, but yeah. you, you had mentioned some of these key personnel losses. What about key personnel additions? I, I'm thinking about the way, you know, Wisconsin lost to Rutgers, Wisconsin loses to Rutgers again. But Rutgers has been a little bit shaky back and forth. Let's say, you know, Rutgers wins, wins out the last few games of the regular season, wins a couple of games in the Big Ten tournament. Do you think that, you know, kind of reverse situation might happen where all of a sudden this team adds a Jeremiah Williams that it wasn't going to have for so long. How does the committee look at Rutgers and then maybe a team like Wisconsin, which has a loss or two against that team that looks maybe quite a bit different than it did for so long in the season and its metrics aren't baked in for the addition of a Jeremiah Williams all year. So I'll answer the second part first like how that impacts Wisconsin. And the unfortunate thing is it doesn't impact the teams that win or lose. It's like another one that I've, I've talked to a lot of big East fans has been Seton hall and Kadari Richmond's their best player. He's played some games, haven't played some games. And they're like, well, we beat Seton hall with Kadari Richmond, but since mm -hmm. he's been in and out, their metrics are kind of low and it's pretty much Q2 across the board, but we beat them at full strength. Kind of same thing you're talking about here with Rutgers players in, players out on the Wisconsin front. It's really going to matter of, when the committee sits down the week of conference tournaments for the, the power six leagues and some of those other big ones, that's that last week, where does Rutgers sit at that week? And that's how the wins and losses versus Rutgers for any of the teams in the big 10 or non-conference is going to factor in. So I look at it every single week and it adjusts depending on those, just like we talked about Minnesota moved from Q1 to Q2, that can change some things a little bit there, but it really only impacts Wisconsin's resume based on how Rutgers looks when they're actually in the room making those decisions from a metric standpoint. On the yeah. Rutgers side of things, we, we can actually see some adjustments. A Rutgers example, unfortunately, because it's they've had a little bit of a skid again, I don't think mm -hmm. that they're going to have done enough to make up for it, like the Mississippi State example, where their only bad losses were without Tolu Smith, their best player. But he's been back since January, so they have two full months of data and that they've completely shown that they are the team that most people thought they would be, a six to eight seed type of team. And so they're going to get seated that way, even with losses to Southern and Georgia tech in the non-conference, unless they lose out or something, but assuming everything goes kind of as expected, but in a case like Rutgers, it was just a little bit too late and there wasn't enough of an uptick. There were some great games. Rutgers looks better. Like there's no question, mm -hmm. but it's just not, they didn't have to win out when he came back, but they needed to do, it was a little too late where they needed to like almost do that or have a little more dominance. And it's just been like, yes, they look better but you can't completely ignore it before. And so it's it's probably going to be something where maybe Rutgers gets an edge and gets a, a likelier chance for the NIT, unless, mm -hmm. of course, they win the Big Ten tournament, which who knows. But that particular case is a little late. But there are examples, like you're talking about, where it does come into play for the team actually impacted. Yeah, the only reason I ask is because back when Wisconsin first lost that game in Piscataway, my thought was maybe Rutgers continues going on a run here. Unfortunately, you know, they had, they had that loss to... Maryland, the loss to Minnesota obviously hurts. It's like, well, maybe if they just keep winning, that Q2 loss will look more like a Q1 loss. And I, I don't know, you never know. Um, but as I think Wisconsin fans should hopefully listening to you so far, feel a little bit more relieved that the skid overall is going to be put into the big package of the resume throughout the season. Yeah. The rest of the games still matter. 
let's let's look ahead. This this is going to be published uh, on the morning where Wisconsin is going to be playing Illinois. Uh, I believe in your latest projection, you have Wisconsin and Illinois both as five seeds. Um, how does this game affect how you're going to think about either of these teams? Does the fact that you have both of these teams right now as five seeds make it any bigger of a game in your mind toward predicting the bracket out, you know, at least as of right now, February, March, but as we release this February, uh, uh, March 2nd. So on the second part, I don't know if it has that much more emphasis because it's two teams that are, are still realistically, if you're talking about a ceiling, they're still in the mix for one of those protected seeds, top four seeds where you get a little bit more location preference. It's not mm -hmm. just strictly in seed order and then bracketing principles, et cetera. Like, it's kind of something that a lot of teams are, are seeking for. And the 5-12 upset happens a lot, so I think it gets in some teams' head. 4-13 does happen, but I think a lot of teams are like, let's see if we can get to a four seed. Illinois is a little bit closer now than Wisconsin is, but I think it's it's going to play a, a massive role. I think if, if Wisconsin were to win, for them to get back into four seed consideration, it would need to be convincing. I think it just kind of holds their, their serve on the five seed for now, but there's games left in the regular season, and – in the conference tournament to try to improve that. Whereas Illinois' resume, because their their metrics are a little bit more inside of 20. Wisconsin's are all top 23, but they're all kind of in the 20s. Illinois are a little bit better. They're a little bit closer, and that gets a lot closer to a win. That would be quad 1A. That's the upper half of quad one, which Illinois is missing something like that. It's not a guarantee that it would stay there, but that's something that's a goal that they can kind of check that box for themselves. So it would really help them, especially with how many results go down over a weekend, they could get closer to that four seed line. But unless it's a blowout one way or the other, I don't think either is in, in danger of falling off the five seed line for the day. Just thinking about who's on the six line, very close a team like Dayton, they play on Friday, this particular day as, as of right now against Loyola Chicago. That's not something that's going to move the needle a ton to get them up there. Washington state plays UCLA. who's not as good this season. That's not one that on its own is going to move the needle. There is Florida that's sitting down there on the six seed line that's inching closer. They have fantastic metrics, and they play, I think it is, South Carolina, which South Carolina's metrics are lower, but it's still a, a win over a tournament team that looks better. If they were to convincingly win, that's a sleeper team that could sneak up if, say, Wisconsin lost by double digits and the metrics fell more to the 25, 26 range. That's a concern there, but I, I think if the game goes as expected and it's competitive, I don't think either team's at danger from that result alone. Obviously, other results matter of falling off the line, but I think the winner gets a lot more likely to actually get to a four seed, where especially mm -hmm. if Wisconsin were to lose to Illinois, doesn't hurt you. I just think it's the missed opportunity for another big win that's like, we're still alive. Let's put some of those that recent skid to bed, and we could still be in the mix for a four seed, where I don't think a four seed's dead if they lose. I just think the likelihood of it probably goes under 50%, and they're going to really need to have a nice close in the last two games, plus maybe like one or two in the Big Ten tournament. Like, just don't have a bad loss in there. Yeah, I think Wisconsin would. Wisconsin has faced this, this position before back in 2019. They ended up on the five line, got sent out to San Jose, had to play Oregon in the first round and lost. Uh, not where Wisconsin would like to end up, uh, would much rather like to end up in that first round site of uh, Omaha or wherever the uh, Indianapolis is the other first, second round site around the Midwest. Um, yeah, yep. would much rather end up there. Um, if it's not a four, let, let's say Wisconsin keep keeps climbing. I think realistically, the ceiling is probably they can only get up to a four just based on their performance as of late. But what do you see as a, a potential ceiling for Wisconsin to climb up to if? Yeah, everything starts going great. And, you know, they knock Purdue off once, for example. I think the real, like, like you said, I think realistically Wisconsin's range is getting smaller. Like we said, eight nines, mm -hmm. if they lose out at the floor, I think realistically their, their entire range is looking like a four to seven, depending on mm -hmm. how the season finishes, where a four is the ceiling. Just because if I think about those teams that are on the three seed line, the lowest ones are like a Duke, Iowa State, Baylor. Yeah. One, they don't really have any bad losses left on their schedule in most cases, or if they do, it's like, well, if they lose that game, then sure, but the odds are pretty low. They're 80, 85% chance to win that kind of game. And all of their metrics are top 12, top 13, in some areas, single digits. Even with Wisconsin beats Purdue, it's hard at this late in the season to be like, yeah, they're going to go from 22, 23 in a strength of record to like not. 
Yeah. And it's going to be hard to catch up there, but I wouldn't say it's out of the question. I think probably to get a three, it's winning the big 10 tournament. Maybe not winning out. Like let's say it's finishing the seat regular season two and one, and then winning the big 10 tournament just to put that in the committee's head. Now, grant the big 10 tournament final is on the Sunday of selection Sunday. Yeah. They like to ignore that one. (laughs) Yeah. And and they like to ignore, ignore a lot of it, especially after Thursday of that week, because that's when they start meeting. Right. It's really mostly important for those bubble teams that are playing on like a Tuesday, Wednesday, and it's like two bubble teams playing each other in a eight, nine game in a conference. And maybe that's like a, a kind of playing game. If you will, you can look mm-hmm. back on and be like, that was the one that, that got them mm-hmm. in. But we did see last year, Marquette was a really good example where they were pretty much a solid three yeah. seed the whole week. They win the big East tournament. Wasn't really sure if they were actually going to jump over. I think it was Baylor who had a better resume before the whole week, but didn't win the big 12 Marquette wins the big East. And they decide to honor that by giving them a two seed instead of a three seed by winning the Big East championship. So that's where I'll leave the door open for a three. But if they don't win the Big Ten tournament, I'm, I can pretty much put it to bed that it's not the case. I really think it's they're, they're probably the ceilings of four. And I think that can start with with the win over Illinois. But I don't think that's necessary because you have Purdue left on the schedule. Mm-hmm. So it probably requires one of those two and then beating Rutgers unless you go on like a really deep run. But again, if you don't win the Big Ten tournament, how much are they actually caring about the Saturday game or the Friday game seating wise? Mm-hmm. That's that's always a question and kind of varies on the committee. And in most cases, they don't. So I think to get there, it probably is going to require at least one of those two over the, the projected tournament teams. Um, as we look forward to Wisconsin in this five, six range, I think there are some pretty scary mid-major teams in that range that Wisconsin could end up playing in the first round. What's of those teams in your current projections are you looking at as this is a good team they're not going to have the resume to climb much higher than that 12 13 spot but i don't think any power conference team wants to mess with them in the first round of the ncaa tournament yeah the, the first one that comes to mind and both are not zero at large it's from the sunbelt conference but the, the odds are slimmer james madison has a better shot and the other one's appalachian state they both have proven james madison won at michigan state appalachian state won a home game against auburn in the non-conference both have had a couple losses the Sun Belt in general has been lower but they're they're both uniquely different in the case where James Madison's one of the highest three-point field goals attempts per game in the whole country they have a lot of guards that can shoot a lot of a lot of threes and they do play some pretty good defense but if they get really hot they could probably beat anyone especially if, if Wisconsin's offense is a little bit more cold on that day whereas App State still has the good guard play I'm huge on that for any mid-major I think normally they're smaller teams but they have solid like 5'11 six foot guards that can really shoot sometimes it feels like in power leagues not every guard can shoot but they're 6'5 and athletic that's kind of yeah. the biggest difference but then they're usually also smaller teams but App State and they showed it against Auburn which is one of the better offenses yeah. in the country it was at home but App State is a very underrated defensive team like they will they will lock you in and it doesn't matter about the size for them like sure you can get them a- occasionally in the paint but they're not really worried about giving those up and still allowing only like 50 to 60 points and they can still score. They have some good guards, but I think either of those teams are, are pretty dangerous. And then I will say too, it's the, the Ivy league always is tough. They're fundamentally yeah. sound. Almost every single player on their entire roster can shoot from the outside. They don't turn the ball over a lot. That's really the case of all three teams that could potentially make it a Princeton, Yale or Cornell that feel like the main three that are most likely going to get in and they're going to fall anywhere from, Princeton could get to an 11 because their metrics are higher, but mostly they're going to be a 12 or 13. So I think those two are, are pretty dangerous. And then there's so many other options. But the last one that I'll say is one I, a team I mentioned earlier that's ranked in the AP pool now is South Florida, just because they're playing really good basketball. And I think they can use that as massive motivation if they do get in and it's winning the American and they're a 12 seed. And they they will have won at that point probably like 19 of their last 20. They're playing great basketball. Their head coach and best player were at Kennesaw State last year. Yep. So they have NCAA tournament experience. They had Xavier on the ropes. They're not going to be intimidated by any big name school that's on the five line, whether that's Wisconsin, whether it's an Illinois, whether it's a Clemson, like whoever that is, they're not going to be intimidated by that. They they played against FAU, went to the Final Four, didn't bother. Like it, it seems like that team's really playing good basketball. And there's something to teams that are just red hot as opposed to you know, maybe like a UC Irvine who plays in a tougher conference, like the big West, not tougher than the American, but tougher than say like the Sun Belt. Mm-hmm. but you're, 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 because it's tough. You're not on like a 15 game win streak coming into the, 
the tournament because some of those right. teams like UC Davis, Long Beach State, UC San Diego, they're all kind of the same. They're all pretty good. So you are losing winning where it's like South Florida kind of forgot how to lose. Like it's just, <laughs> they've lost, they've lost one game in conference. They have their longest winning streak. I think in program history, they tied it something crazy, but yeah. there's just something about those teams that they're just, they come in, they're like, yeah, they've won 18 straight. And it's like, they don't remember what that's like. If they're down 10, they're like, we're just supposed to win. We just always win. And they're not intimidated by the big moment. They have some guys with tournament experience. So it's a lot of answers there for sure. I feel like all those teams are kind of dangerous and, worrisome if you're on the, the five line, but really like those Sunbelt teams and, and South Florida, especially. Yeah. Can't blame you for throwing a lot of names out there. I, I think a lot of those teams in that range are, are dangerous. I mean, you mentioned Princeton brings a lot back South Florida, which just won its first conference title ever under a head coach who brought Kennesaw state to the NCAA tournament last year. I, yep. I also think in my head, making East state. Yep. I want nothing. I want nothing to do with Will Wade. Absolutely yeah. nothing yeah. to do with they Will could, Wade. They could score it too. They, they beat, I mean, Michigan's not as good. BC didn't have some of their guys, but they beat big brands in the non-conference. They're not going to be intimidated. And Will Wade, you know, is not going to – he's a good coach. He's, he's going to have them ready. Yeah. So you could pick anybody off of anyone's 12-13s right now, and there's a reason they're a 12-13. They just right. didn't get enough good games on their schedule. That's why they can't get an at-large. It's not their fault. They just didn't play enough good teams, and that sometimes it's a scheduling issue. Yep, absolutely. Um, all right, if – you think there there's going to be any surprises on selection Sunday? Maybe not necessarily in your mind, but maybe to fans who don't follow the sport, you know, from November on. Uh, what what do you think might surprise some folks on selection Sunday as we are 16 days away? One that I've just had my eye on for a while. It's it's more of a theme, but something that just feels like because in most brackets that you're seeing right now people generally put for their, their automatic qualifiers as teams that are in first in mm -hmm. their conference. And so two, two leagues, the Atlantic 10 and the American, South Florida and Richmond are leading their conferences. But Dayton yeah. and FAU are really the only at-large chances from those leagues. If we Last year we had zero bid thieves. So if we were to have less right. than two, which most people are projecting, there are some teams. Right now it feels like the teams that are in the field – feel pretty good. Most people would agree with the top 44, the 11 seeds. And then it's kind of varies of like, if you don't have those AQs in there, does a Colorado get in? Does a St. John's get in? Could Villanova get themselves back in mm. or a Utah Syracuse? Like there's lots of, lots of options, but I think because of that, if we were to get one less bid thief and a lot of those teams don't win out because they have bad losses left, it is the potential of a two bid Sunbelt or a two bid Missouri Valley. I think, Drake and James Madison and Indiana state, whatever one of those two yeah. doesn't win the Valley. If you look at it from just like a, what are the brand names of the teams? Who have they beat, et cetera. Like you look at app state and James Madison, they have the one that jumps off and then you're like, who are these teams? You look at Drake at, they beat Nevada, which is getting a little more hype after a buzzer beater, but it's still mm -hmm. in an eight, nine seated team. And then they've beaten a lot of teams in their conference, Indiana state played Michigan state close their best wins at Bradley. So you're kind of thinking like, where are those wins there? But we have seen from the committee in the past where they will, because they just didn't get as many opportunities, sometimes they will get a little bit of a bump there. And all of those teams have the metrics to justify being a lot closer than I think some people are ready for. We're just kind of talking about a lot of the big brands. So if we were to get only one bid thief and some of these other teams didn't all win out, which the odds of that are slim, I think we could end up seeing a shock where it's like, Indiana State wins the Missouri Valley, and in the last four in is Drake, and a lot of people don't have their their eye on that. Or the same thing, maybe App State wins the Sun Belt. James Madison still gets in because they're thirty one and four. Mm -hmm. and people just kind of forget about those things. So that's it. Wouldn't surprise me as much, but I think there's some help that would need to be there. But looking at those resumes, if you're not following the sport super closely, you're like, where are the wins there? But the committee has definitely done a service to to some teams that have proven it, have done something in the non conference. And just don't have a lot of losses. Neither of those teams have a lot of bad losses either. Other than App State has a couple, but they're also undefeated in quad one and quad two, which is wild, but they have three bad losses. Like, how do you handle that? <laughs> That's been a headache for myself too, but they've been an automatic bid for all year. So I've just kind of been like, well, they're automatically in my field because they're in first. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't happen, that's when those discussions start to go. And I think not everyone's radar is on that. It's a lot of like, can Rick Pitino get back in? Syracuse has been hot the PAC 12, are they only going to get two bids? Like all of those different things have been more of a topic than some of those mid majors, which I wouldn't be as surprised about. Yeah. Got to, got to help a, a, a two bid Sunbelt for 
you know, this resurgence of Michigan State down the stretch here too, right? That big win to yeah. kick off the kick off the college basketball season entirely. James Madison getting getting that win and has just been sneaking around. The wins just hanging around on James Madison's resume uh, cool. and looks better and better every day. Uh, all right, T3, this has been fantastic. Is there anything you wish I would have asked you during this conversation? Any last thoughts or feelings before I, I let you go on with the rest of your evening? I think it's I think it's pretty good. I think it's just uh, you know enjoying the rest of the season and uh, appreciate everybody's you know kind of listening and anyone that that follows me at T three Bracketology on Twitter, all those comments. But I I I think you kind of covered a lot of the hot topics. I love being able to talk about what's most emphasized versus least. I feel like those are questions I'm answering constantly. Like you said too, I think it's it's something that doesn't just separate myself. I feel like, but a lot of a lot of other people that put a lot of hard work in that. Are building platforms but might not have a tv platform we get to do mm -hmm. a lot of great stuff like this on really cool podcasts like yours but might not be on on national tv and a lot of those folks don't always answer every question that you get they might answer a few but that's something that's not just myself there are a lot of other good ones that will answer a lot of those questions and so it's it's cool to do it in a forum like this but the, the main platform too on twitter slash slash x is a, a great forum for that as well well that's wonderful um like I started at the very top, I also think it's great that you answer people's general questions about bracketology, about why you have teams seated where compared to whom. I, I think it drives discussion around the sport in a way that I think is is really, really good uh, for a healthy debate between mostly sane people on the internet, um, yeah, but it is no, the so. internet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that is T3 Bracketology. Please go find him on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at the letter T, the number three, Bracketology. Uh, or at t3bracketology.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Really, really appreciate it, T3. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. That is T3 Bracketology. Like I said at the beginning of the show, like I said earlier in the week, one of, if not my favorite bracketologists on the internet, uh, so, so much insight and makes, makes a good point, right? There's so many of these big brand bracketologists, for lack of a better term, who have TV platforms, big network platforms, uh, who do good work to be sure. Uh, but there are also some, this has become, I mean, an obsession an industry for just fans on the internet to do. And, and some of them are doing even better work than some of the biggest names, you know, uh, and T3 Bracketology is up there with the absolute best of them, uh, accurate, insightful, informative, Super glad that he came on the show. Uh, give him a follow on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at T3 Bracketology. That's the letter T and the number three. And thank you for listening to the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. I got to go watch this uh, Wisconsin-Illinois game. If you're listening to this before the game, uh, I, that's what I'm doing next. If you're listening to this after the game, man, what a game that was. Go team. Thank you for listening to the Scotty Six Pack Podcast. I've been your host, Kedrick Stumbrus, and you can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. While you are here, leave some kind words in the reviews. Five stars really helps other people find the show. You can also watch us on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty Six Pack. While you're there, smash the subscribe button and hit that bell to get notified as soon as we put new shows into your feed. We're going to be wrapping up that Wisconsin-Illinois game. Going to be talking Wisconsin hockey, women's team, hopefully getting that sweep over St. Thomas to advance to the final faceoff. The men's team hopefully getting a win of the Big Ten Conference regular season title over Michigan State. Right of a jam-packed weekend. We'll be back with you on Monday on Wisconsin.